My name's James Eckland, and I've seen the future. I've seen your future. Uh, yeah, well, I was right. I saw into 2026, and that's why Sarah asked me to come uh, speak. So thank you to her, Brian. Uh, thank you guys for having me here. I am, um, I'm going to go through what that future looks like, and it's a bright one. It's, uh, you know, spoiler alert, it's really good. There's water, there's, uh, there's not as much carbon in the atmosphere. It's, uh, it's a really bright, beautiful thing for Colorado. But you can't get there if we don't act, okay? So uh, 2026 is what I'm looking into. Uh, we need action in 2022. Uh, see what I did there, Sarah and Brian? Uh, in order to make sure that we get to the future that I've foreseen for all of us. Um, let's, uh, I can advance these if you want. It's no, no, no big deal. Uh, thank you. Just the arrows? Ah, oh, perfect. All right, how much money do I have in my wallet here? I've got... I've got like 12 bucks in my wallet, it looks like. I will give this $12 to anybody that can name this mountain range. You're all good Coloradans. You can name that, yeah. Well, it's, it's kind of a trick question. It's not even in Colorado. It's not even North America. That is in central Norway. Uh, so, sorry. I think my 12 bucks was pretty safe, so I put it online. Um, this, uh, this, is where, this is where my story begins. Uh, these are my great-great-grandparents, Ole and Mary Gunderson, who homesteaded on the western slope of Colorado in 1888 from Norway. This part of the world was going through a, a massive economic recession or depression in Europe at the time, and a bunch of people, probably ancestors of people in this very room, uh, came over uh, to escape that economic reality. That when they pulled into the... Uh, Western Slope, and specifically the homestead that they ended up uh, forming a cow-calf operation on that my parents still run today, this is what uh, it looked like, minus the canvas. The, the teepees from the Ute Indians were still, the poles were still standing on the property because they had just removed the Ute peoples down to the southwestern part of the state. And the reason I bring that up is because you have to know your history in order to move forward. And my family has benefited exponentially uh, because of somebody else's misfortune. And uh, that reality means that you don't see, a, you don't see one of those native uh, uh, stickers on my car because I'm not a Native American, but that doesn't make me less of a Colorado. And the point of this slide is to make sure that People understand, unless you're a Ute Indian, which maybe there are some here, uh, that we are not the original inhabitants of this place. We have to make sure that we understand that. And we are careful not to bar entry to people who are coming after us because we don't deserve uh, this place any more than they do. Uh, that, that said, uh, if you recognize this, this is a basketball team uh, from a movie called Hoosiers. I don't know, anybody not seen Hoosiers? Okay, good. Uh, so this, this, is a, this is an eight person. How many of the guys? Yeah, yeah we got eight, eight guys up there. And uh, this, is, this might as well be the picture of the Pritchett High School basketball team from 1974 that my dad coached. Uh, uh, to the state championship uh, that year. And it exemplifies to me that this David and Goliath story that is being really um, portrayed in the water uh, arena as we sit here. Uh, we have in Colorado on a good day with COVID people moving from Texas and California in here, six million people. California has 40 million people. Uh, we have uh, a handful of legislators. We're going to get one more in the Congress. Uh, California has the majority of those. Uh, we are small. We are this team. Uh, but teams this size can win state championships. You can win if you play the game the right way. 
And so that's my message to you, is that if we unite and we don't backbite each other and we don't create division within our state, well, you came here 10 years ago and my people were here 50 years ago or 100 years ago. Uh, we can get to the future that I think we all want. If it all, there we go. Okay, so why am I up here? Why should you listen to me? Um, a couple of things that, that I was able to uh, be around for. I felt like Forrest Gump when this was all going on. I was legal counsel to Governor Hickenlooper at the time. And when Governor Hickenlooper uh, asked, turned to us and said, what's our strategic plan for water? We said at the time, this was a 2010, 2011 vintage, uh, we don't have one. And why don't we have one? Well, we don't have one because it's a private property rights-based system. And we get hit about the head and shoulders pretty hard as state bureaucrats if we go out into the general public and say what, tell people what we think they should do with their own personal property, their own water right. And that's why we don't have a state water plan. Well, Governor Hickenlooper said, you still have to have a strategic plan for the asset if it's as important as you're in here every other day telling me it is. So get on about the business of developing one. And we had the, thank goodness, we had the structure that we inherited from the basin roundtable process that was set up in 2003. So every basin around the state had these groups of ordinary citizens, people like the people in this room, coming, driving long distances. Many of you probably did this uh, to La Junta or to Pueblo or wherever, Lamar in, in the Arkansas and, and uh, Alamosa in the Valley or Del Norte. And they had these meetings and they put together basin implementation plans and then those went to Denver. So we flipped the script. It wasn't a bunch of bureaucrats like me sitting in Denver thinking up a great water plan for the state of Colorado. It was coming from the basins uh, themselves. And so it was, that was why it was successful. Um, that happened in 2015. In 2019, there was the signing of the Colorado River Contingency Plan, which was the first plan in the river's history to recognize climate change as a real problem and that we've got to have a contingency plan if it continues to get worse. Well, guess what? Another spoiler, it's gotten worse, like by a lot. So, and we're going to talk about that in a second, but that's why I'm up here. That's why uh, I think I have a perspective that uh, I wanted to share. So, um, we're up here uh, in, you know, in uh, Trinidad, and I know down in Raton they're having the, the Spaghetti Western uh, Festival, which is, happens to be my favorite genre of Western movie. Uh, and, and they, uh, they I felt the good, the bad, and the ugly is how I'm gonna go through water and, and our future here in Colorado. Uh, believe it or not, Back in, you, you guys are too young to remember this, but there used to be this thing where you would go and you would pay money and they would give you a ticket and you would go into this dark room and you would sit next to complete strangers with no mask on and you were like only inches away from them and then moving pictures would show up on the screen just like this and you would watch that for like two hours. Again, like you didn't know these people that were in there with you. And uh, anyway, that's, that's, the, uh, that's the reality of... Of, uh, of where we find ourselves today is a, a different world uh, socially because of COVID, but also hydrologically. And that's what we'll go through here in a second. So what's the good? Let's start off with that. The good is that we are the headwater state. That's your fair state. This is John Wesley Powell's map, by the way. He drew this and he said, instead of having states according to these arbitrary survey lines, we should do it by river basin and uh, he didn't get much traction. So we've got what we've got, the, the, the purple box here, which happens to include the major headwaters to the major rivers in the Western US, uh, including everything to, on the Western slope that drains into the Colorado River Basin that I'm gonna talk about here in a second. Uh, but this is, uh, this is a good thing, 18 downstream states, 18 downstream states and the country of Mexico get water that starts in your state. So that means when it comes to water, you have something to say about water policy writ large. This is a, this is a good, like I said, this is a good thing. Uh, the bad thing is, and it's really hard to see the lines on this map, so I'm gonna put Colorado in there again. Uh, 
this is uh, a climate map that just shows you what uh, temperature anomalies were for the last June. And I got news for you, this looks very similar month on month, year on year, over the last 20 years. We've seen our ambient air temperature go up in order of magnitude, five degrees Celsius in the darkest red here, which is in the Colorado River Basin. So that means that we've had precipitous decline in the river system itself. Well, what do we have to collect this uh, water uh, and manage this system? We have the two largest reservoirs in uh, the country with Lake Mead and Lake Powell. And they're both uh, compromised. They're both at less than 30% of their capacity. And they have, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, gone down so fast, so quickly, that they have outstripped our ability to project risk and do the, do the kind of uh, uh, shortage uh, distribution that we had planned in even 2019. We've kind of outpaced that in the last two years. So this is Lake Powell. This last year that you see, uh, that we just lived through, is the last water year we just lived through, is in the bottom line there. Now, what you notice about the lines up above are not only they higher, that means more water's in the reservoir, but it also means that in the spring, you're seeing a pretty good bump, right? The water's going back up. In our year we just lived through, we saw very minimal, uh, if any, bump at all in the spring. And we are forecasting more of those years. So that means that Powell is going to keep dropping. Right now it's at 29 points as of this morning. It was at 29.71% of capacity. That's at elevation 3544.92. Uh, that's above mean sea level. The significance of that is that that is only a handful of feet above the minimum power pool that's required to turn the turbines to generate hydroelectric uh, power for the Rocky Mountain West. You've got load following power that's really expensive if you have to go to the spot market to generate, uh, to, to buy more water. Uh, and that's where we are with Lake Powell. So that's, that's the bad. Oh, this is a live feed Sarah got me from Washington DC. That's, uh, that's going on as we speak. There's no white knight coming in here from the federal government, if you didn't know that already, uh, to save us on all of these uh, water management problems that we have uh, on the major rivers. We have nine interstate compacts and two equitable apportionment decrees with the U.S. Supreme Court. That's how important we are as a headwater state uh, to, the, to the entire western part of the country. Um, the reality is we have to fix this ourselves. And the only way I submit that we're going to be able to do that is if we work together. This is the ugly part of Colorado. This is a hydrologic map of our state. So the rivers are bigger to represent bigger volume, bigger flow. So as you can see, 80% of our precipitation is over on the western slope on the part that drains into the Pacific through the Colorado River system. 90% of our population is on the eastern side of the divide. So that means, right, we've got, well, we have 25 Trans Mountain diversions that bring water from the wet side to the populated side. We, we move 500 to 600,000 acre feet of water every year that way. If you know, you're not in water, I apologize for the acre foot reference, that's, volume, that's the volume of measurement we use. If you go to the football field and you fill it up a foot high full of water, excluding both end zones, that's an acre foot of water and that's enough for a typical, uh, uh, you can actually get by with two or three average sized households can get by on one acre foot of water per year. So 500,000 acre feet is a lot of water that we bring from one side of the state uh, to the other. Here's the other ugly part. Uh, this is land ownership, land status in Colorado, right? So you've got US Forest Service up there, you've got the national parks, you've got the uh, BLM, you've got uh, the Department of Defense, the state uh, land board lands, the tribal lands, and everything that doesn't have a color on it is privately owned. That means that the stuff that is uh, in the white uh, cream colored uh, up there 
has to involve the private sector, has to involve private individuals or private companies, private businesses. If we're gonna get this done, we have to work together. We can't just say this is a federal issue. We can't just say it's a state issue or a local issue for that matter. It has to involve us, people that own water rights, people that use water, people that buy products, which is everybody in the room, uh, that use water. This is what's going to <laughs> tear us apart. Uh, our urban-rural divide is real. Our policies are made by 100 legislators. There are some of them gifted ones in this room, former and current. And they will tell you that the reality is the vast majority of their colleagues are not from rural Colorado. The vast majority of their colleagues are from the urban area. And that means that we have some work to do because the folks that I've, I'm from Denver, and uh, even though I spend a lot of my time over on the Western Slope helping manage a cow-calf operation, the reality is most people don't know that there's a water issue at all, or that agriculture, locally grown agriculture, is really uh, facing some, some pretty significant challenges when you talk about supply chains, access to markets, commodity prices. That is a real problem in irrigated agriculture. Some of the smartest business people, the smartest business people I know are in irrigated agriculture. And uh, that's not the brand that they, that they have to deal with. People, people usually think of them as not, uh, not savvy business people. And I, I guess that's another message I'm here to, to bring to you is that that's just not true. We have to get over this urban-rural divide. We can't divide ourselves uh, among, that, uh, among those lines. We can't do it with public sector versus private sector. We have to get them both on the same page. The person from WGU uh, was talking about public-private partnerships with T-Mobile. That's the kind of thing that we've got to start thinking hard about uh, in, in water. Um, it's also true that we can't be xenophobic. I started out talking about the Ute Indians and uh, there are two bills in our state legislature uh, that are on bill paper right now that would seriously and negatively impact irrigated agriculture in Colorado by discouraging or actually even criminalizing uh, making a profit if you're in irrigated agriculture and you buy a water right. I'm just gonna say that again. I'm just gonna say that again. If I buy a water right, if I'm ranching my, my folks' property and, and I buy a section next door or a quarter section or whatever I can next door, if I buy that water right, I have to sign an affidavit saying that I won't sell it for a profit within a certain amount of time under this bill that's currently been uh, put on bill papers, not been introduced. That is it absolutely flies in the face of the free enterprise system. It, it negatively impacts our agricultural value. The assets, a vast majority of our assets in ag irrigated agriculture, the value is in our water rights. And if you diminish our water rights with ideas like this and further divide our state, uh, I, for me, that's a, that's a non-starter, and I would submit to you that that's something to, to uh, be careful about. Um, there, now, there's good news here. There's the good news. I'm not just doom and gloom. Uh, this is how we solve this problem. This is one of the ways. So we pay people in agricultural production, right? You pay the farmer, you pay the rancher, and what do they get to do? They get to innovate and they will, they do it every day. They make do with what they have and they will do it in the, on this topic. That means increased flexibility to adopt regenerative agricultural pra practices that save water, sequester carbon, and builds healthy soil. Senator Simpson is here. He has been a champion for healthy soils in this state. That is how we build our resilience instead of stripping it off of our, off of our land. If you do that, you slow climate change and aridification, which is the whole reason I'm up here whining to you in the first place. So then if you do that, you build better agricultural conditions and greater resiliency, and guess what? That puts money into the pocket of irrigated agriculture. So that's the cycle we need to be perpetuating, and we can, we can do all of this. 
We can do it even though we're small. We can do it even though we're not California. We're not 40 million people. We're not a huge congressional representation state. But we can do this with our skills and we're a, we can be a well-coached team that puts this issue of water and issue of scarcity and how we're going to manage our way out of this bind that we're in, we can really, uh, we can really coach ourselves to success. And, and that's what they did in Hoosiers. That's what my dad did in Pritchett. Uh, and I, I submit to you, that's what we can do. So thank you so much. <laughs>